Um, yeah, so I'm Christopher Batterby from, I'm just kind of coming towards the end of my PhD at the University of York. I'd like to talk about some results towards kind of uh, group-based efficient signatures we got out. Um, and we're pronouncing this spud sign, where spud is British English for potato. Okay. Um, I'm also, just kind of an editorial note, I'm kind of in the lucky position that like a lot of the stuff that I was kind of going to gloss over was covered very well by the talk we just had. So for details, refer to that. Okay. So what's spud sign? Uh, it stands for semi-direct product Diffie-Hellman signatures for reasons that will become clear. Um, and basically the idea is it's a group action based signature scheme uh, similar to Seafish, which we just heard about. Um, but we kind of solve, we kind of introduce a new group action and uh, solve some kind of sampling problems in those types of schemes. So um, I guess kind of retreading some ground here, but the first step is let's talk about what a group action is. I'm writing my groups um, additively because they always have to be abelian. So I'm writing uh, the group operation as a plus and I'm saying that the identity is zero. And basically, a group action is a finite abelian group, a finite set, and this function star that kind of lets us bounce around the set using group elements. Um, and it kind of has to play nicely with the group operation and has to be fixed by the identity. We have this initial, we have this kind of extra requirement that it should be free and transitive, which kind of one of the immediate consequences there is that uh, for every pair x, y, there's a unique group element g, such that g acting on x gives you y. Okay. And so from these group actions, it's kind of not too difficult to come up with a sigma protocol where we're proving knowledge of uh, this secret s. So this is the unique s, such that s acting on x0 gives you x1. And the prover knows it and wants to prove this to the verifier v. So they commit to some i by picking r uniformly at random. Uh, the verifier kind of tosses a coin and sends back zero or one. If C was zero, we get R back, and if C was one, we get R minus S back. Um, and then kind of all this public information that was transmitted is called a transcript, and the verifier, as a function of the transcript, decides if they accept this proof or not um, by checking if P acting on XC is equal to the commitment. So the first thing to check is that, indeed, this works. Uh, so if C equals zero, then R acting on X zero certainly gives you the commitment back by definition. Um, but because we've required the compatibility with the group action, acting by S and then by R minus S is the same thing as just acting by R. So indeed it works. But um, <clears throat> it's kind of worth noting here that uh, a prover who doesn't know S can kind of nevertheless convince the, ver the verifier with probability a half, right? Because uh, if this verifier is honest and is kind of behaving as we expect them to, and generally we can limit ourselves to that scenario, um, then if they say zero, then I can just say R without having to know S, and my transcript gets accepted. So in practice, we have to run a bunch of these in parallel um, to kind of drop this soundness error of a half. OK. Um, I don't, despite the title of this talk, want to talk too much about the signatures themselves because I guess they're kind of standard and also, as I say, they've been covered. Uh, but basically the idea is that you can model um, these kind of interactively generated transcripts using hash functions and you can generate them non-interactively. Um, the challenge space here is kind of zero or one, but if you're running a bunch of them in parallel, it's like zero, one to the n. Um, and you get kind of secure signature schemes in the quantum random oracle model as kind of the Seafish scheme showed with respect effectively to free transitive group actions that kind of show that these results of Don et al. go through in the quantum random oracle model, provided that you have uh, two properties, one of which is called special soundness and the other which is called honest verifier zero knowledge. Uh, these schemes are kind of set up originally, these sigma protocols are kind of set up by definition to give you special soundness. So we won't talk about that. The one that gives us trouble is honest verifier zero knowledge. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, the kind of security we get is based on this, what I'm calling the group action discrete logarithm problem, what was referred to this morning as the vectorization problem. 
uh, it's kind of known to emit quantum sub-exponential algorithms. So it's basically a dihedral hidden subgroup problem. <clears throat> okay. So honest verifies zero knowledge. Um, the idea is that we should be able to produce a transcript like without knowledge. So given some challenge, without knowledge of this secret S that we're trying to prove knowledge of, we should be able to produce a transcript that passes and is distributed the same as an honestly generated transcript. And that's kind of a way of modeling that you don't learn anything from knowing the secret. Um, so I claim that this will do. Uh, obviously this passes just by definition, but um, if you think that kind of honest transcripts look like this, provided that you're sampling this R uniformly at random from the group, then these two things will be distributed the same as this thing. So we've got this uh, kind of the same distribution that we wanted, um, but it does rely on our ability to sample uniformly at random. And this is kind of the trouble with, um, so this is kind of the problem we're stepping in to solve here. So <clears throat> the kind of mainstream example of these group actions, we've heard about them a bit, come from these class groups acting on isogenies. Uh, but generally speaking, it's difficult to compute this class group. It's difficult to compute its structure exactly. And therefore, it's kind of difficult to sample from it uniformly. But you need to sample uniformly. So there's been a couple of workarounds to this. One of them is um, CFISH, which we heard about. And basically, you can just compute this group as like a one-time expensive offline computation. Um, and then once you've got this structure, you've got the parameters and everything, and you can sample uniformly at random. But it basically means that your parameter generation has to be either offline or very slow. Or um, I think it also emits like a, I think you can do it quickly if, with a quantum computer. So I think I've heard CFISH described as a post-post-quantum scheme. Um, the other one is CSIGN, which uses this fiat Shamir with a Bortz paradigm of Lyubashevsky, which was developed for uh, lattice-based signatures originally. Um, and it does give you nice short signatures, but it takes a long time to sign because you're kind of building a load of redundancy into it. So to recap, certain types of group actions give these nice kind of short post-quantum signatures via the fiat Shamir transform. Uh, but we need to be able to compute the group in this group action because the security proofs rely on it. Um, and kind of you're in existing examples of this, you're kind of um, stuck between choosing between slow parameter generation or slow signature calculation. Uh, but it would be nice if we had a group action where we could compute this group easily, right? So uh, this is kind of where we come in. So this is the semi-direct product bit of semi-direct product Diffie-Hellman. Uh, and the semi-direct product is just, well, I mean, you've probably seen the semi-direct product before not like this. It's like a quirk of the literature that we write it like this. But basically, we're talking about ordered pairs from the group and its automorphism group, and we define the multiplication like this, uh, where this thing just means apply phi and then apply psi. Um, and certainly this thing is a group you can check, but it turns out that we're interested in uh, what happens when you do exponents in this group. So we're defining a function s from the integers into the group just by uh, what happens when you take the first exponent of this exponentiation. And it's kind of worth noting here that I'm just going to be pronouncing this s, but like it does correspond to a choice of g phi in the semi-direct products group. So you get a bunch of different functions s. Why do we care about S? Well, it's got kind of two interesting properties. Um, the first is to notice that if you think about what S of X plus Y is, and then kind of follow the definitions through and apply the group multiplication rule, and then apply the definition again, you can see here that we've kind of somehow extracted Y from the argument of S and put it outside. Um, so another way of thinking about this is that uh, there's a function, which I'm pronouncing step, that allows us to add in the argument of s. So y step s of x, just defined by this expression, is the same as s of x plus y. Um, and this kind of, I mean, it's not written like this, but uh, this is basically what's noticed by Habib and Kaparis and Karabai and Spielrein back in 2013, 
and they define what's become known as semi-direct products key exchange, which is kind of a Diffie-Hellman type key exchange, right? Because you can see that Y step S of X is the same as X step S of Y. So that kind of immediately gives you Diffie-Hellman type key exchange. So that's where the Diffie-Hellman bit of SPUD comes from. Um, <clears throat> the other interesting thing about this function S is that it kind of loops, so it comes back onto itself so uh, because this is a group element, there's certainly some capital N uh, that takes it back to the identity in the semi-direct products group. So therefore, S of capital N equals 1. So if you think about the set of all integers that are mapped to 1, there's therefore a smallest one. We'll call it little n. Uh, and it turns out that this set curly C for cycle um, has size little n. So if you start at 0, that's 1. But it turns out that you don't repeat yourself until you get back to one. So you have size exactly n. Um, and the other thing is that, OK, if you think about what n plus y step s of x versus y step s of x, uh, just kind of following the definitions through, because s of little n is 1, an automorphism send 1 to 1, uh, these two things are the same. And from here, it's kind of not too difficult to show that uh, the group of residues modulo n, this curly cycle thing, and star, which is just step extended to take um, residue classes as an argument. You kind of can see here that that's well defined. It's not too difficult to show that this is a free transitive group action. So there's, this is our group action. Um, but in order for this to be interesting in the context I've described it in, we need to know how to compute little n, right? Because if you compute little n, then you could compute this group and you can do uniform sampling, and that solves the problem that I was talking about. Um, so kind of our main theorem is as follows. So this is like our, so it turns out that little s, so yeah, yeah s has this kind of long product form, which isn't too hard to check by induction. And so our main theorem is that if capital N is the order of G phi as a semi-direct product group element, and little n is the smallest integer that gets sent back to 1, then little n divides capital N. Um, for time. I got time. So um, it's actually not too difficult to see this, so I guess I'll go through it quickly. Uh, Basically, the strategy here is write capital N in terms of little n and then show that this little l is 0. Um, so certainly, S of capital N is 1. So we have a product of this form by our kind of little stepping stone theorem. Um, so then it just kind of, we've just got to rearrange this long product, basically. So we can write this set of integers 0 up to uh, big N minus 1 kind of just by partitioning off into little groups of little n, and then we've got the L of them left over. Um, and it's kind of not too difficult to check that you can therefore rearrange your product into groups of little n, and then you've got little l left over. Now, this is the definition of S of little n, which is 1. Automorphism send 1 to itself, so we're left with an automorphism applied to S of l is equal to 1, and therefore S of l is equal to 1, but uh, that must mean L is 0, because otherwise we have a positive integer less than n that gets mapped to 0. Uh, sorry, not to 0, to 1. But that contradicts the kind of minimality of little n. So L is 0, and therefore little n divides capital N. Um, if you're maybe kind of scratching your head about why this means you could compute the group, here's, here's an example. Um, so this is the group we kind of tentatively float for use with spud sign. It's this kind of matrix group that's uh, basically suggested for kind of literature specific reasons that I won't go into. But it turns out it has order P cubed, where P is an odd prime, and also its automorphism group is polynomial in P. So that means that for any choice of G phi, where phi is some automorphism of this group, the little n that you want to calculate divides P to the 6, P minus 1, right? But there's not many factors of that because we've already got its prime factorization. And in fact, with this extra requirement that little n has to be smaller than the size of the group these elements are coming from, because otherwise you kind of spill over the group size, um, there's only five values you have to check. And so if for some value x, like candidate value x, just in order of size, you just have to check if s of x equals 1. And then by definition, the first one you get to that is 1 is little n you're looking for. 
Um, and the other thing is that because we're basically just doing group exponentiation, we can do square and multiply techniques. So each of these checks takes like about log p or log poly p semi-direct products group operations. Um, so as long as you can do, so here for example, you can see that like this matrix multiplication isn't going to be too bad. Um, so we've got an efficient way of calculating little n. I mean, that's basically it. I thought I'd kind of also um, talk about the resulting signatures aren't kind of ridiculously huge. So in order to estimate the size of the signatures, you've basically got to think about um, how bad the quantum attacks are, and they're generally the kind of complexity of these quantum attacks, um, just like algorithms due to Kuperberg and Regev, which I think we're going to hear about later. Um, it kind of, there is a function of the size of the group in the group action. The other thing to say is that kind of as we heard a bit in the last talk, you can't actually really do the kind of base version that we've described because basically the soundness error um, with a challenge space of size two, the soundness error just doesn't kind of shrink fast enough. Uh, so the kind of workaround to this proposed in, I think, C sign originally is you basically kind of boost your challenge space and you still get the same computational problem pretty tightly, but uh, basically you can kind of shove all that growth that you need into the public keys. So you get long public keys but short signatures. Um, so borrowing estimates from like maybe one, a slightly more bearish estimate of uh, what kind of parameters you should take for uh, this kind of group action discrete logarithm problem to be relevantly difficult. Um, we kind of su we suggest that the that this little n should be kind of set up such that it's about 512 bits. Um, and if you do that at the kind of short end of this um, trade-offs between, so you can control the trade-offs between uh, the size of the signatures and the size of the public key, at the kind of extreme end of this in terms of short signatures, at this one parameter level, some kind of little back of the envelope calculations would estimate it to be about half a kilobyte, a bit more. Um, which isn't terrible, you know? So that's it, really. We've got these promising short signatures providing efficient sampling, um, but we need to do a bunch of like checking of the uh, constants in the asymptotic security estimates and implementation and stuff before we're ready to say what our parameters actually are. But kind of on a philosophical note, I think kind of insofar as post-quantum cryptography exists as, or has since 2016, kind of existed as distinct camps, this was a good example of what happened when there was kind of dialogue between these camps, right? So we wouldn't have known about how to make these signatures without the isogeny literature, but also kind of in the other direction, we've given something back by solving a problem in the isogeny literature. Um, and that is everything that I wanted to say. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes. There's the microphone right over there. Uh, question. Uh, in, your, in your initial back of the envelope guess, you mentioned that the short signatures had long public keys. Uh, well, how long are we talking about? Megabyte. Oh, sorry, that was loud. <laughs> Megabytes, like really long. That microphone is on, in yeah. case anyone's wondering. <laughs> Thank you. For dramatic effects. <laughs> dramatic effects. Megabyte. Perfect. All right, do we have any other questions? <clears throat> so, I'm sorry. I, you probably said it early. I understand Seaside, how you're having a vector act on an, uh, uh, an isomorphism class. How are you having your uh, 
uh, your, your semi-direct product group act? Like what, what is the actual direct object you're acting on? So uh, we're acting on a set that occurs as like a so actually can I? Yeah. Thank you. So we're acting on uh, this set, which is basically occurring as like a subset of a group, um, and we're acting by residue classes modulo this kind of parameter little n that we're interested in calculating, um, and we're doing it basically just by kind of um, applying a function to like a, a function from the integers and the group into the group itself just by uh, doing this calculation. So if we want to calculate y acting on s of x, we do phi to the y of s of x and multiply that by s of y. Um, and it turns out because um, n plus y step s of x is the same as y step s of x. This is well defined if you want to instead take residue classes rather than single integers. So the group is residue classes modulo n, and the set is a subset of a different group. OK. So, so there are no curves? There's no curves. So I mean, I guess another nice thing about this is that uh, this is kind of defined for any group g. OK. OK. That's that. Yeah, which is, I, I mean, not every group G is going to be a good choice, and that's kind of part of what we need to do is kind of uh, characterize which is and which isn't. But um, I guess it's, you do have some, like, flexibility. Thanks. Yeah, there we go. All right, I think we have time for, yeah, like one to two more questions if anybody has any. All right, well, let's go ahead and thank Christopher one more time.